the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and welcome to this Mishcon Academy session. Part of a series of events, videos and podcasts looking at the biggest issues faced by businesses and individuals today. I am delighted to introduce today's guest, Brett Easton Ellis. A renowned author known for deftly blending satire and social commentary, Brett launched his literary career at the age of 21 with the novel Less Than Zero. Since then, he's published another eight books, including his most famous work, American Psycho, and worked on countless screenplays. Uh, so, The Shards is a story that you've tried to write multiple times over the years. What do you think was different this time around? Um, well, I, I, I'm old. <laughs> I think that was the key to unlocking this book that I first thought about when I was 18. Um, I was already working on Less Than Zero, and I was involved in this thing called, I called it the Less Than Zero Project, that I began when I was 16 years old. And I was working on that at 16 and 17. And then a series of events happened when I was a senior in high school, when I was 17, that um, altered everything. They were, it was kind of the moment where uh, adolescence gets corrupted into adulthood. And so I put away Lesson Zero, and I attempted to write The Shards, which is in many ways uh, a warning about um, uh, writerly imagination and how it can get away from you. And in many ways, it's about how you can control uh, or have to control your superpower, you know, the, uh, the kind of the origin story of becoming a writer and realizing you have to separate fact from fiction. I did a lot of embellishment when I was a senior in high school. I lied a lot. I was a fabulist. You know, I made up things. I wanted things to happen that weren't true. And uh, I wanted to write about that because it caused a lot of damage. I had friends who haven't spoken to me since over whatever the things that happened then. And Less Than Zero was kind of like um, a vibe. It was a vibe novel. It was kind of like a hangout novel. And I thought, OK, the 17 or 18-year-old can write this book about going to parties and like driving around and just sort of like you know, maybe doing some drugs and just, just like having this plotless, a non-narrative book, essentially, that I was trying to find a way to express numbness as an emotion. So that began to preoccupy me much more than this uh, really complicated story with a lot of characters uh, highly defined um, in the shards. And so, you know, I, I tried it. I kept coming back to the shards uh, throughout the decades. I, sometimes I'd look at it after I finish a novel, and it just never, it just never really landed, and then finally, uh, one night during lockdown, it was April of 2020, you know, I was just thinking about my classmates, I was, there was nothing else to do. And I think what opened the door was that it wasn't a 17 or 18 year old boy narrating these horrible events that happened. It was the 57 year old man. That opened the door for me to look back in a very nostalgic way, in a very expansive way, about 1981 and Los Angeles and the freedom of being a teenager there. That opened the door, and um, I felt that by this time, I could attempt this rather long book. Mm -hmm. You paint an incredible picture of early 1980s Los Angeles, uh, and there are kind of two quite significant threats that are very much part of that landscape. So this, there's a serial killer and there's a, a cult. And I'm just wondering, were these concerns for you growing up in that time? Uh, they definitely were. I mean, you know, the, one of the myths um, that haunted uh, LA and my childhood at that time were, was the cult of the Manson family and the Tate LaBianca murders. And there were cults that weren't just the Manson family. The Manson family influenced a lot of cults. And of course, there were serial killers 
everywhere in California when I was growing up. It was like the wallpaper. It was like the background. There were two or three that were on the nightly news all the time. There was something about the notion of a serial killer when I was 18 and I was following them. Um, certain narratives would be building that these serial killers were knowingly or, un or unknowingly creating. They were telling a kind of story and I was thinking about that at 17 or 18. I was making this tenuous connection between being a writer and kind of screwing things up with people and my friends and making things up and also the danger, I thought, of the serial killer narrative. And so it became a metaphor uh, for me really early on uh, and I, it has definitely stayed with uh, me until I finally wrote this book. Brett, something you explore in a number of your works, is, I guess, is this idea of scratching the surface, that the facade that you mentioned earlier, there's often this idea of presenting things, things look incredibly beautiful, or people live in these glossy, perfect landscapes. But the idea is there that if you kind of remove a few of those layers or if you look beneath the surface, there's this inner world of turmoil and panic. Is that something that personally resonates for you? I think it personally resonates for everybody. I think it's just part of life. I mean, I think uh, worry and panic and stress are just things that we all live with daily. And, you know, it depends on your uh, personality, uh, your way to navigate through them or to, you know, to deal with them. I think something that uh, influenced me a lot when I was growing up was... Uh, coming of age in this beautiful city, Los Angeles. It was paradise. And yet, there was a lot of unhappiness. And there were, uh, you know, there, it, there was a disparity between the beauty of the place and also um, some, uh, this pain that a lot of people went through. There was something about it in Los Angeles that just made it seem uh, stranger more painful in a way, weirder. Like, how could this be happening in this setting? And so I think I was drawn to that notion and that was kind of what Less Than Zero was about. That really is what my LA novels do kind of traffic in a little bit. Pierre Bedroom certainly does, The Shards certainly does. Um, so yeah, that, that was impactful. Um, you mentioned that The Shard started originally serialised on your podcast. Did that influence the shape of the story in any way, choosing that kind of serialisation? No, not at all. The, the, the plot of The Shards, I had outlined in 1982. And so I knew the, the events were... Inev the events kind of, if you start the book, realise have this kind of in inevitability. It's just, it's got to... It's starting at this place you kind of get what's beginning to happen and then you realize, oh my God, this is where it's going. So I was about 250 pages into writing The Shards when you know, it, was, it was lockdown. We had no podcast guests, no one was coming over. I was tired of doing these monologues about the virus and the season of the virus and how hysterical it was to have to wait in a bread line to get into a supermarket and all of this stuff that just seemed crazy to me. And so I told my producer, I said, you know, I'm working on this novel. No one has ever serialized a novel. Let's do it. And it didn't affect the book at all. Um, so, uh, no. No. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, the, book, the book was the book. It mm -hmm. was the book. Mm -hmm. It was just like there was nothing else to do. Hi. Um, this is a question, a, a slightly more technical question, but it relates to what you were talking about, about the pleasure and the fun that you have when you're writing, yeah. which I think really comes over to me as a reader. I think the, the pleasure of reading your fiction is, is, um, is huge. And I think that, that quality of being a page turner, which I really associate with you, that kind of sense of wanting to gobble a book up is really strong in this book. Mm. Um, but it really interests me that you say that you you seem to be saying that you don't redraft your writing, and you use unreliable narrators, and you withhold a lot of information, and that drip 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 of information is key, I think, to the pleasure that you create for the reader. So I'm just wondering, can you explain how you know if if your writing is so emotional and so 
um, kind of forward, has a lot of forward momentum. How do you create that very careful, skilled withholding of information? First of all, I don't know. I, can't, I don't, really can't answer that. I do know that there are two phases for me writing a book. Uh, outline. Outline is almost the first draft for me. My outline for American Psycho is almost as long as the book. I had so many examples of how I was trying to, how do you put madness on the page? How do you do it without going all Stephen King? And you know, how do you, and so I had all these examples. Is it microscopic attention to detail? Is it over observational? Is it, is it whatever it was, whatever the things I was thinking of in order to do it in an, in an original way? What happens is that is a very emotional first draft, and this was as well. There's another draft. The cool technician comes in, and the cool technician wants to make sure that stylistically it's working. He does a lot of editing. He rearranges things. But again, as this dedication to this book says, for no one, it really isn't. It's for me. It's the book for me, and that's the only way I can write. Thank you so much, Brett. We really appreciate it. I think it's some fascinating insights into both the shards as well as your process, and uh, we've covered quite a lot in today's conversation. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today. We are standing room only here, and to everyone who's joined us online as well. Uh, Brett, I do understand you have a little bit of time if people do want to get the shards. Of course. Uh, autographed yes, so they can come up course. and do that. No problem. But otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at another Academy event soon. Thank you. Thank you. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.